All right, today we are looking at the book of Hebrews, uh, the first of the books that are considered general epistles. As I told you, the, the book of Hebrews has not always been considered one of the general epistles, uh, primarily because of a confusion about who wrote it. This is the only book of the New Testament that we have absolutely no clue who the author is. There is nothing, the book itself does not name its author. Um, at various times, people have thought it might be a letter of Paul's. In fact, the King James Version re reflects that in the fact that it says a letter of Paul, in, in the original King James, a letter of Paul to the Hebrews. But Pauline authorship is now pretty much universally rejected for several reasons. One, Paul does not identify himself in this book. As I say, there's no author identified, so it is anonymous in that sense. Um, there are, in the whole book of Hebrews, the author only uses four personal pronouns, I or me. You compare that to Paul's usual, for instance, in the book of Romans, Paul uses a personal pronoun for himself 103 times. In 1 Corinthians, he refers to himself in, in the pronoun form 175 times. So, stylistically, this is much different in terms of the approach. Paul really, really felt, and we agree, that God had uniquely ordained him, and so much of his presentation of theology was oriented around toward his own revelation, his own experience. The writer of Hebrews does not deal with that at all, in terms of their own focus. Um, it's also true that this book is more eloquent and poetic in its Greek than Paul. And I'll mention this later. The, this is considered probably the most elegantly written, in terms of the Greek language, of any of the books of the New Testament. Whoever wrote this was was very poetic, was very eloquent, was, and Paul, Paul was, you know, Paul was a lawyer. Paul's writing, his, he was a brilliant guy and very thoughtful, and he presented his, his thoughts well, but in a kind of a lawyerly kind of way rather than a poetic kind of way. Um, and, and in fact, Paul's tendency is to go on rabbit trails. You know, Paul will be talking about something and then something will occur to him, and he'll go off and talk about that for a while, and then he'll come back, and then he'll go off this way and talk about something and come back. The book of Hebrews doesn't do that at all. There are no rabbit trails. The book of Hebrews is, is uh, meticulously and methodically structured from start to finish in terms of its arguments. Um, some people had thought that it might be written by Paul because there's a reference to Timothy at the very end, the final you know, benedictions and greetings. They mentioned that Timothy is expected to be released soon, and they hope he will arrive. Well, some people have assumed that, well, that means it was Paul, because Paul traveled with Timothy. Well, Timothy did a lot more than just Paul travel with Paul. Um, particularly, he was involved in being the, the pastor and then later bishop of Ephesus and various other things. So there's nothing inherently necessary about it being Pauline if it mentions Timothy. And again, we are not questioning the, ver the reliability or veracity of the book by saying it only was written by Paul, because it doesn't say it was written by Paul. Just people have made that up. Um, other authors that have been proposed for this have been Luke, um, Philip, the evangelist, Silas, one of the companions of, of Paul, Barnabas, uh, Apollo, who is uh, Apollo, who's from Alexandria, who is said to be a man of great eloquence, eloquence and uh, teaching. He didn't have his theology filled out. I mean, he was eloquent in teaching and apparently a great teacher. He went to Corinth and other places we know about but he was taught the details of the faith by Priscilla and Aquila. Um, some people have proposed Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome was one of the very early bishops. Various reports call him either the second bishop of Rome or the, or the third or fourth bishop of Rome. He was uh, bishop of Rome between 92 and 99. Uh, apparently became a Christian by Peter's witness and testimony and was, was anointed and, and ordained by Peter. And so very early on in the church, in fact, he's considered the first of the apostolic fathers, uh, Clement of Rome. Or some people have proposed that perhaps it was Priscilla, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Priscilla apparently was a, was a very strong leader and a woman teacher. In fact, the first time they're mentioned in the New Testament, it's Aquila and Priscilla. And ordinarily, you would mention the man's name first. But after that, every time they're mentioned by Paul, it's, that he refers to them as Priscilla and Aquila. Her name comes first. Now, um, there are a number of people who have actually suggested, I mean, there's various test, various people who suggest various names. Tertullian, uh, early, one of the early church fathers, suggested Barnabas. Um, various other people have come up with different names. The interesting one about Priscilla, a, a woman, various people, Ruth Hoppen is a, a modern scholar who has written a book 
in which she looks at archaeological evidence and other suggestions to support the idea that it might have been Priscilla. Uh, Gilbert Bilizikian, who is the head of the Biblical Studies Department at Wheaton College, believes it was probably Priscilla. Adolf Harnack in 1900 was the first one who suggested it might be Priscilla. Um, A.J. Gordon, Donald Guthrie mentions her by name as a possible. Uh, Donald Guthrie's theologies are very well known. So there are a lot of people who are beginning to think it might be Priscilla. Um, I, I, I'm inclined in that direction just because the, of the fascination of it. Um, that there is one thing that mitigates against it being Priscilla, and that is in one place, the, one of the few places that the writer of Hebrews refers to himself as a pronoun, he uses a masculine pronoun rather than a, than a feminine pronoun. That would seem to indicate it probably wasn't a woman, but there's other, again, Ruth Hoppen has written a whole book about this, and when she looks at archaeological evidence and other, you know, other sources to suggest it might have been Priscilla. A reason why Priscilla or Apollo might be candidates, or a particular reason they might be candidates, is because of who they were or their names. In the case of Apollo, Apollo was from Alexandria. He was Jewish. There was a huge Jewish population in Alexandria. He was very learned. Alexandria was a place of great learning. That's where the Septuagint translation was done. Um, and at one point, as much of, as a third of the population of Alexandria was Jewish. But Apollo, being a Hellenized Jew from Alexandria, for some reason his Jewish parents named him after, after a Greek god. And so the idea that his name was Apollo might in itself have been offensive to Jews. You know, they, they, a name means a lot to, to Jewish people. And so it may be the reason why his name is not attached to this book is because his name would have been seen as offensive to the people it was written to, and that is Jewish people. We'll talk about that in a second. So that might be the reason. The reason Priscilla, if she was the author, might not be recorded is that people would not want, have wanted to receive it if it was from a woman. Now, um, that lack of knowledge, absolute knowledge of who the writer is, goes all the way back to the very early days. I mean, obviously when it was first written, people knew who it was from. But as early as the first century, late first century, we lost track of who wrote this uh, for some reason. And that's so obvious, I mean, that's so per peculiar a thing, for it to have been accepted as being canonical based upon its eloquence and based upon its theology, especially its Christology, how it presents Jesus. Um, it was accepted for those reasons. The fact that it was popular for that, but we forgot who wrote it, suggests that for some reason there was an intentional getting rid of the author's name. Apollo or Priscilla might be good candidates for that. Mike, did you have something? I was just going to comment that the masculine pronoun may be explained by the fact she's a woman too as a way of mas masking the fact that she's a woman right? yeah that's possible i mean it's it's not sufficient enough of a negative uh, for people like ruth hoppin and gilbert bilizikian and others to say it can't have been her and so it's not a conclusive thing origin of alexandria the first part of this quote is he said that from of old some men have said that paul wrote it but who actually wrote the epistle only god knows we don't know who the other ones. But again, because of the eloquence of it, because of the theology of it, especially the Christology, the presenting of Jesus as the Messiah, um, it, they had trouble with the, the lack of known authorship, but nobody's ever had trouble with the, the, the theology, the content. And so ultimately, that overwhelmed the reluctance people had because of not knowing who the author was, and it became part of the canon. In terms of a date, we believe it probably was written sometime around uh, 65 AD. Now, the book of Hebrews, one of the major themes is it talks about, as we'll see in a minute, that Jesus is supreme or superior to any other uh, religious system, including Judaism. And one of the things is he says, the writer of Hebrews, he or she, says that Jesus is superior to the sacrificial system of the law. Well, the fact that that's a major point, but there is no mention of the fact that the sacrificial system of the law has now been stopped. You know, it, it ended when the temple was destroyed in AD 60. Causes us to believe that it had to have been written before that because it would have been completely appropriate and natural for the author to have referred to the fact the sacrificial system had ended if this had been written after AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. He doesn't do that, which suggests it was earlier than that. The earliest reference we have to it is Clement quotes Hebrews in AD 95. So we know that it, and, and whenever you have uh, some text quoted, you have to realize that given the fact they didn't have email or you know, publishing back then, 
if it was quoted in 1895, there had to be a substantial period of time prior to that for it to have been written, distributed, recognized, appreciated, copied, distributed some more before one of the scholars of the early church would have quoted it. And so that leads us to believe, you know, we know it was in the first century, so it's not like it was so far after the fall of the of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple that it couldn't, you know, that that wouldn't have mattered anymore because it was quoted in 1895. So we believe it was before that. The likelihood, because it mentions Timothy, for instance, is that it was somewhere around AD, uh, AD 65. That's our, our best estimate. C always means circa. means the best we know. Okay. Um, it was affirmed as canon, meaning that it was a God-inspired writing for our edification, by the Synod of Hippo, in 393, Hippo is where Augustine was from in North Africa. And then again, it was affirmed by the synods of the two synods of Carthage in 399 and 419. Now you'll notice it wasn't finally affirmed as canon until the fourth and fifth centuries. So it took a while. And the reason is not because of the content, as I said, or the theology, but rather entirely because knowing who the author was was one of the most critical things. They felt like it either uh, the, the New Testament books were credited as canon if they were written by an apostle or were written by someone who was associated closely with an apostle and therefore was affirmed by an apostle. The Gospels are the good example of that. You know, Matthew and John were apostles. Mark was a companion of Paul's, but also particularly was the secretary and assistant to Peter. And so the Gospel of Mark is very much the Gospel according to St. Peter. And Luke, of course, was a traveler and a companion with Paul, who during Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea apparently interviewed everybody in Jerusalem and gathered his information, but it was affirmed by Paul, who was recognized as an apostle. So you see all of the books tended to be either written by an apostle or affirmed by an apostle that someone else, most of them, had written it. Hebrews took a long time to get affirmed because we don't know that about it. We don't believe it was written by an apostle. We don't know who the, who the person was, okay? But it was eventually confirmed as being, um, as being canon. In terms of the recipients, to the Hebrews does not occur in the text. It's believed that back in the days when this was written as, as a scroll, they would put labels on the outside. This book is clearly written to Jewish Christians because the whole orientation toward the Jewish faith and how Christianity about Jesus is, is an advantage or superior to that. Uh, to the Hebrews was what it was uh, labeled as in King James and then carried on down from there. But it's believed this may have been a tag that was attached to it a long, long time before the King James. So to the Hebrews, um, most likely this was written to Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering persecution and who were considering uh, reverting back. Bob, I've asked people to sit forward. Would you mind moving up a little bit? Um, it's not very fair for me to have made them move up and then you sit back there. Uh, so the Jews were under, undergoing persecution and they were converting, uh, they were considering, apparently, based upon not the introduction or anything, but just the content, they were considering reverting back to Judaism. Um, the Jews had a unique kind of position in the Roman Empire, and that is they were the only religious group that was allowed to not worship the emperor that were allowed not to be part of the regular kind of cult worship of the emperor or of the Roman gods. They were given a pass because the Jews proved to be very useful to the Romans. You know, from scholarship, they were financially very adept. The Romans had a choice. Either we're going to destroy all of them, which we don't want to do because the Jews proved to be fairly useful, or we've got to give them this because they're not going to give up. The Jews proved that over a long period of time. They were not going to start worshiping some other deity, even if it was the emperor. And so the Romans had said, okay, the Jews are the only exception we're going to make to that. Well, when the Christians came along, at first the Christians were treated well because they were seen as a sect or a part of Judaism. Then, as Judaism and Christianity started differentiating themselves very clearly, Christianity came under persecution. Well, the Jews who had become Christians, who began to suffer persecution in the first century, they realized if we go back to being Jews, we're not going to be persecuted anymore. And so there was a temptation for them to go back to their Jewish roots. And this book is written to encourage them not to do so because of the superiority of Jesus to any other Jewish faith or any other religion. 
And it not only was written for them, but for everyone since then who is considering either following Jesus or struggling because of uh, difficulties in their life or for whatever reason considering that they might, you know, they might give up on their faith and go to something else. So this book has been passed down for 2,000 years to our benefit. Now, Walter Martin, Dr. Walter Martin, by Lancer Man, uh, he once described this book, you know, he was always sort of tongue-in-cheek, he said, this book is written by a Hebrew, writing to Hebrews, Telling those Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. Which is, a, for all of the quip that's in there, it's very accurate. The person who wrote this almost certainly was Jewish because of their references to Jewish worship. They were very Hellenized Jew because of the quality of the Greek that's used. As we say, if it was Apollo, he, did, he was so Hellenized because of his name, he didn't want him to know his name. But it was written by a Hebrew, writing to Hebrews, telling those Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has two sort of strains or focus, focal points. One is the doctrinal exposition about the nature of Jesus and his supremacy over other things, uh, other religions, other beliefs. So one is a doctrinal, and this is, as I said, the Christology, the presentation of Jesus as the Messiah and Savior in especially the first ten chapters of, of Hebrews before he gets to the Hall of Fame of people of faith. The first ten chapters is the most uh, poetic and beautiful and complete Christology in all of the New Testament. Because uh, the writer of Hebrews goes through and he compares Jesus to all these other options. I'm going to show you a slide on that in just a minute. And, and confirms that Jesus is superior to all those because of his nature, his character, his person, and his work on our behalf. But then there's also the hortatory aspect of this book. Hortatory means urging, you know, to... To, hortatory is to push somebody, to, to work hard to convince them to do something or to believe something. The hortatory or urging part of this is to uh, urge the people not to give up on Jesus and go back to Jewish faith, but to stay true to Jesus. So part of it is doctrine, part of it is working very hard to convince them of, of, to, to do something. Okay. Stop me if you've got any questions about all that. Um, some people um, suggest that the book of Hebrews... Like the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians, these three books, two of Paul's books and the book of Hebrews, have, have something in common in that all three of them, in one way or another, are working to try to expand on Habakkuk 2.4, which says the just shall live by faith. All three of those books, Romans, Ephesians, and Hebrews, have a, a great deal to do with us living our lives as the people of God in a way that, that is supported by our faith and supports our faith. Um, and the reason in Hebrews why this is true is because the object of our faith, the thing that forms our faith, is Christ himself. The book of Hebrews is the most Christ-centered book in the entire New Testament. Now, there's, there's, that's everything about Hebrews, is the focus on Jesus. So, um, the theme is the supremacy and superiority of Christ as Messiah, as High Priest, as Savior and Lord um, over all, and he goes on, uh, I'll give you the particulars in terms of what he's greater than in a minute. As I said, this is in the first ten chapters. There's a great deal of focus as well on the fact that Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection guarantees salvation and eternal life in a way that no other belief system can. So everything is oriented on Jesus, his nature and character, who he, his person, the person of Jesus, and especially his works for us on the cross. The fact that he is mediator to the Father is part of that as well. And this start, this book starts out, we'll look at it in a few minutes, um, calling itself an exhortation. Now the word for exhortation here, this translated exhortation, actually is a word that elsewhere is used for sermon. So we believe that this book may not have been written so much like Paul's letters were, as a, as a letter of instruction. It might not have been a letter at all. It may originally have been a sermon that was presented as, you know, they preached a lot longer than we did now. If I try to get up and preach the whole, you know, the whole of the book of Hebrews, people would probably be ready to leave about the fifth chapter. But um, the, the whole focus of this is very much an exhortation, and it, it very possibly was a sermon originally. The supremacy of Christ, one of the things that the writer of Hebrews does in order to demonstrate that supremacy, is he gives Jesus a number of different names. He refers to him as the Son of God. 
He also just refers to him as the son. He calls him our priest and then our high priest. He calls him the forerunner, meaning he was the first one who, was, who died and was resurrected, and we will be resurrected after him. The pioneer who blazed the path through death to salvation in his resurrection. So all of those things are ways in which the writer of Hebrews develops this theme of the supremacy and superiority of Christ. He compares Jesus in the first chapter to the prophets of the Old Testament and declares how it is that Jesus is, is uh, greater than, superior to, the prophets of the Old Testament. In the first and second chapters, he goes on to talk about the angels and how Jesus is superior to the angels. Um, the angels, by the way, would have been very important in this, in, to the Greek world. Now, he's writing to Jews, but a lot of those Jews were influenced by Greek culture as Apollo was, for instance. Um, the Greeks in that time tended to think of the Greek gods as though they were angels. They were sort of demigods or demiurges. They were divine creatures, but not equal to the great high God. And so the concept of angels was very important to, he to Jews, but also to Greeks. And so to Jews and Jewish Greek, uh, uh, Hellenized Jews especially, the idea of Jesus being superior to the angels would have carried a lot of weight. It actually means he's superior to any of the Greek gods, in other words. Uh, the writer then talks about how Jesus is superior to Moses and to Joshua, two of the great leaders of the Old Testament legal system. Moses, who of course was the giver of the law, Joshua, who was the leader who took them into the promised land. The writer of Hebrews talks about Moses as being a faithful servant in the house of God, but he was not the son. And he draws the analogy, says that no matter how important a servant is, he's not equal to the son. The son who owns the house is more important than the servant of the house. And he draws that parallel between Moses as a servant and Jesus as the son. He also talks about Joshua, who sought to take people into rest, if you will, to the rest of the promised land, uh, meaning that the, to, to find a place where they could settle down and not, not have the trials anymore. And that Joshua was successful in taking people into the promised land, but he could not bring them into the Sabbath rest as Jesus can. Jesus, by his salvation, can bring us to the place of complete rest eternally um, in his presence. He then goes on and he talks about Aaron, who is the first high priest, and the whole Aaronic line of priests. And here they bring up the very mysterious character of Melchizedek. Melchizedek appeared in the life of Abraham after Abraham had gone, gone and fought the, the kings in order to free Lot and everything. He's on his way back, and Melchizedek shows up, this mysterious character. He is identified as both priest and king, Abraham honors him by giving him a tenth of what of the, of the <coughs> booty that they got from defeating these kings. And Melchizedek, the character, presents or serves Abraham wine and bread as this is foreseen as an early communion kind of thing. Well, Mel Melchizedek is this, this mystery. There's no other character that's ever defined as both priest and king. They're always either priests and priests or prophets or king or kings, but never both. You know, David was not priest or prophet. He was king. Samuel was not king. He anointed the kings, but he was priest and prophet. So Melchizedek is this mysterious character who gets talked about here. And in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about him not having had father or mother or genealogy, but that the order of Melchizedek was the order of Christ as this unique high priest who was both priest and king, that was sort of a precursor to Jesus. Some theologians have suggested, did the Son of God make an appearance to Abraham in the form of Melchizedek? So that quite literally, Jesus was Melchizedek. We don't know that. Okay, and, and if you did, it, if you looked at that wrong, you could take it in the wrong direction. So I don't want to do that. But it does talk about the fact that the role of priests. The writer of Hebrews says the role of priest, Aaron being the first high priest, was to relieve guilt and to relieve confusion. They did that by offering sacrifice for the, for the forgiveness of sin, sacrificing of animals to relieve guilt, and of teaching God's word in such a way that they were make it clear to them what their, what their focus should be, what they should be doing so that they, refuse, they remove confusion. Well, Melchizedek and Christ is seen as... Uh, 
Christ is seen as the ultimate expression of that. He removes our guilt by his own sacrifice. He teaches us and leads us to take away the confusion. And Hebrews mentions the fact that the bread and wine that Melchizedek offered is now the union, which is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, Try to go too far with that Melchizedek thing and you will make yourself insane. So <laughs> all we know is what it says. We can't go too much further than that. All right? Um, he then goes on, the writer of Hebrews, to talk about the tabernacle and the law. All of these, remember, he's presenting in terms of saying in some detail, because this covers ten verses, <coughs> chapters, saying that Jesus is superior to all of these. So he's superior to the tabernacle and the law because he is superior to any buildings, even buildings that were worship, built to worship God. And he's superior to any self-effort, which is how the writer of Hebrews um, presents the law, an effort on our part to, to act in a certain way, to do certain things in order to make ourselves righteous. That instead of focusing on the written law, the Mosaic law, that Jesus writes the law in our heart, and, as had been promised through the prophet Jeremiah but that we receive the law on our hearts, and the law, while the law made demands on people's lives, the law was not able to strengthen them, or encourage them, or enable them to achieve the law. So the law set the demands, but the law didn't help you. Jesus enables us to be righteous. He gives us righteousness, and in that way is much superior to the law. Okay? Um, questions about that? This. This comparison, the first 10 chapters, which is what this reflects, is the most refined and poetic and eloquent Christology because it compares Jesus with all the things that were important to the Jewish people. You, know, you don't get much more important than the prophets of the Old Testament, especially Moses and Joshua, Aaron, the first high priest, the tabernacle, the law, even angels, you know, divinely created spiritual beings. So the writer of Hebrews goes through and compares all of those things to Jesus and makes the very clear argument that Jesus is superior to all of them. And it makes sense that he does that because his argument is to tell people, don't go back to the Jewish things, which all of these are Jewish things, because Jesus is better. Stay with Jesus, even if it's hard. Okay, any questions about that? I've already mentioned this. The book of Hebrews has the most polished and eloquent Greek of any New Testament book. It has been referred to as a masterpiece of the Greek language, and the anonymity created problems with the Hebrews' acceptance. The book of Hebrews' acceptance is canon, but they got over it by the 4th century, and it was finally affirmed that this is from God, even though we don't know who the author was. And it'd be really fun to find out someday. I'm, I'm rooting for Priscilla. Uh, just, just because. Uh, um, all right, any questions about that? Let me give you then just a few key verses to Hebrews, and then we'll take a break and come back and we'll actually walk ourselves through uh, the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, the introduction. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at, at many times and in various ways. But in these final days... He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Now let me stop right there and say, this first two verses of Hebrews is the reason that we believe that the canon of Scripture is closed. In other words, new, since the first century, new uh, books are not have not been written after what we have as the canon, nor can they be written to add to this. Why? Because the writer of Hebrews says that God previously spoke through the prophets. Now that word prophets there could refer to prophets and apostles. The point is, he spoke through the right, the religious men he had chosen to communicate with us, and many times in various ways, but that's not the case anymore, that God is speaking through someone else to write this stuff down for us. But in these last days, from the end of the apostolic era to today, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. In other words, God gave us everything in writing that we needed up to that point. But from the point of the New Testament writings, everything else is to be understood in light of Jesus, not in light of some other person writing more for us. Okay? So this is why we believe the canon of Scripture is closed. We don't add new books. 
Now people have said, well, what if they found another book, some archaeologist found another book that said it was written by John or Peter or Paul or Philip or somebody else. Um, and all evidence pointed to the fact that it was real. What would we do with that? Well, that would be quite a challenge. The question is to whether or not if it was written in that time, but just not discovered, and it seems consistent with Scripture, the rest of it, there's not a problem with it, then do we accept it? Or do we say that, well, canon has been closed for the last 1,900 years, and so therefore the fact that it was lost may have been God's plan. And we count it as something worthy, you know, maybe worthy to study, but not as divine direction to us. I don't know. That would be a fascinating problem for the church, churches of the world to deal with. Okay, continues verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We used that passage last week talking about God's providence, that all things are sustained. All things in creation by God's providential will are sustained by his powerful word. That is Jesus' powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. He's already started with the comparison of the angels here, which he goes into, into further. But you get this sort of grand and glorious picture of Jesus the Christ here, um, and that sets the stage for everything to come after it. That he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being, sustaining everything by his powerful word. This is the Christology of Hebrews, the presentation of Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. Okay? Beautiful writing and powerful stuff. Right? You feel that? Then we go on to Hebrews 2, the second chapter. We must pay attention, careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. In the book of Hebrews, in addition to the Christology and, and, and the Hall of Heroes of Faith and all that, there are five warnings that occur spaced throughout the book. We'll talk about those when we get into the exact outline and talk about, uh, you know, walk through it. But this is the first of them. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. Pay attention to the revelation of Christ. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by, the, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So, pay attention to the revelation of God. God has been very clear and making us aware of this by signs, wonders, and miracles, and by the Holy Spirit giving gifts, this is the sign of the great salvation in Christ, and you better pay attention and don't drift away from it. That's the first great warning. Okay? Questions about any of that? Let's look at two more key verses, and then we'll probably go ahead and take a break and come back and deal with the, the outline. Um, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firm to the faith we profess. Remember, he's writing to Jewish Christians who are thinking of leaving the faith of Jesus, going back to being Jews. That is, worshiping as Jews. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest. There's that reference to Jesus as the high priest, more than Aaron or anybody else. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus, the great high priest, elsewhere he calls him the, you know, the, the, the perfecter of our faith, um, he understands when we suffer. He understands when we are tempted. Because he has experienced all of that just as we are. Yet he did not sin. And he can encourage us and strengthen us. Remember, the reason that these Jewish Christians were tempted to go back to the Jewish faith from Christianity is because of persecution. So this whole passage here not only identifies Jesus as the Son of God through whom we, you know, to whom we are committed, but also identifies that 
Jesus is there to help us. He understands when we suffer. He understands when we're persecuted. He understands when we're tempted. Because he went through all of that. And so we can go to him and he will support and encourage us in that. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the, and, and the, that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, interesting that although there are lots of reasons we don't believe Paul wrote this, this idea of running the race set before us is a Pauline um, metaphor. Paul uses that in a couple of different places. We don't think he wrote this, but it's possible that the writer of Hebrews was aware of Paul's writings, since Paul's writings were very early. So it also identifies that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, those who are the martyrs, the saints of the church, those who have gone before, uh, witnesses to us. We need to be committed. We need to flee sin. We need to, to stay away from all the things that would entangle us, stay faithful to the race, obedient to Christ, and the way to do it, Keep your eyes focused on Him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. If you focus on Jesus rather than focusing on the persecution, then you will be maintained and supported in that. Because He knows what this is like. He endured the cross, but now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven as our mediator. Hebrews talks about Him being the mediator between us and God the Father in another place. So, um, the object of our faith is the thing that will sustain our faith, is the message here. Bob? Uh, think about the race, referring to our race and the witnesses of the race, etc. It seems a little strange to me for Hebrews. It seems a lot more of a Greek thing. Well, um, the Greeks had, you know, they were much more focused on sports. The Jews were not completely, I mean, they knew what racing was uh, in terms of foot races and all of that. While they didn't have the Olympic Games and the, you know, and, the, and the various other kinds of events, like the Games in Corinth, they certainly would be aware of that. Um, the Greek influence had been great throughout the, the region of the Middle East and Palestine. So in terms of an analogy, they would certainly understand that. Uh, I mean, what people have ever not, you know, what kids have ever, without anybody teaching them, not, not said, I can, you know, I can run faster than you, I can beat you to that, you know, that hole over there, or whatever. Um, and so they would have a sense of what a race was anyway. Plus, they would have a very strong Greek influence toward, um, toward games. Because the Greeks had been around for quite a long time by this time. Uh, 300 plus years. And so they'd be aware of it. Um, even though it's, it, you're right, it is much more of a Greek way of thinking. But Paul uses it, as I say, in several places. So it's something that be, would have been common to them. Other question or comment about that? Well, we're just ripping through this stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and say let's take a break. Okay, let's go through and um, walk through the outline and discuss in a little more detail some of the points that the writer of Hebrews is, is talking about here. Um, this is not going to take us an hour or 10 minutes, so we are going to get out early today, uh, which is fine with me if you all feel like you've learned all you need to know about Hebrews. Um, first, I read to you just a moment ago the prologue, which establishes the superior, superiority of Jesus the Christ as God's new revelation. That, um, again, in case you don't remember what we just said, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many, at many times and in various ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son has got the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. And He has provided purification for sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So He became as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is superior to theirs. Superiority of God's new revelation. The supremacy of Christ, that He trumps everything else. He starts out with that beautiful and bold statement. We then go on to superiority of Christ to various Old Testament figures and institutions um, from the first through the seventh chapter. Uh, first we're told, and this actually begins by the statement in 1-4, uh, that 
Christ is superior to the angels. Recognizing the angels were very important to Jewish people, but also to especially Hellenized Jews, those who were Greek. Um, it gives a scriptural proof of superiority, of the fact that Jesus is able to save us, is able to do things for us that the angels were not capable of doing. That he is the son, and, it, and for that reason, scripture indicates to us that he is uh, superior in terms of his service to us than the angels could be. There's an exhortation, which I read to you, which not to ignore God's revelation through his son. This is the first of the five warnings that occur in the, the book of Revelation. Pay attention, you better pay attention, because God's revelation is powerful for us, but if you do not pay attention to it, then you will not receive the benefit of it. Okay. Then we're told that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for a while. Okay, he's established that Jesus is superior to the angels, but he recognizes that in the incarnation, when Jesus took on flesh, he became a little lower than the angels, but in doing so, he then was able to provide salvation for all of humanity. And this is where it says that having been made like us, Jesus was able to save us. It talks about the fact that because he, you know, he came to save the children of Abraham, not angels, he was made like us, those children, so that in every way being like us, he could provide salvation for us. So, Christ is superior even to the angels, the spiritual beings, which represented to the Greeks even their gods, or equivalent to their gods. They saw <clears throat> Apollo and, and various of the other of gods as being angel-like beings. So there was a, that the Hellenized Jews very much saw a link between them. We are then told that Christ is even superior to Moses. Now recognize Moses the lawgiver <clears throat> to most Jews was probably the most important figure in terms in their history, in terms of their Jewishness. Abraham was their father genetically. He was the father of the Jewish people. But Moses is the one that made them Jews by giving them the law. <clears throat> so to say he was superior to Moses, he's really getting to it now in terms of confronting the, the expectations and desires of the Jewish people. He talks about the fact that Christ's superiority is demonstrated and he says, he speaks of Moses as being a loyal servant, um, <clears throat> that he is, is one who has served the master, who is God, well within the house, but that greater than any, even the greatest servant in the house is the son, the one who owns the house and will be master of the house. So no matter how great Moses was, he was still a servant. Jesus was the son and therefore demonstrably superior, just like any son and heir is superior to, to any servant, okay? He then goes on to an exhortation to enter Sabbath rest. This is the second warning here, because he tells us, um, the writer of Hebrews says, don't harden your hearts in unbelief the way your ancestors did in the wilderness. The Hebrews in the wilderness hardened their hearts, they refused to trust God, and as a result, they died in the wilderness. But for you, this is where Hebrews talks about the fact that the Word of God is a living and active thing. If we are obedient to the Word of God, if we seek to serve, um, to believe in Christ and to serve God through believing in Christ, then we will, unlike the Hebrews who died in the wilderness, were not allowed to enter into the rest that they were promised in the Promised Land. If you have faith in Christ, you will be allowed to enter into a Sabbath rest, a permanent and holy rest that will be given you by Christ as we are in His presence in heaven. Okay. Moses couldn't give him that. He's, he talks about Joshua as well being unable to provide that kind of uh, help. Even though he could lead them into the promised land, he couldn't really bring rest to their lives. We then are told that Christ is superior to the priests of Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, or the, the Levitical priests. <clears throat> he specifically says Jesus is greater than the high priest. Even Aaron, or whoever the high priest is now, that Jesus is able to provide what the priests provide in a much more effective way. He talks about the qualifications of a priest, that priests are elected, and that they then are responsible before God to provide sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins and to provide the uh, confidence which comes from teaching God's Word so people know what God expects of them. But he goes into the details 
that the any other priest that has ever lived was responsible for having to to do sacrifices perpetually to continue to sacrifice well jesus as our great high priest provides a sacrifice once for all so that this doesn't have to be continued he talks about that here and he also talks about it in, uh, in the ninth chapter as well the once for all sacrifice um, there then is an exhortation to press on to maturity this is the third of the warnings which we call exhortations in all three of these cases if you look down through here wherever it says exhortation that's one of the five warnings um, the idea that we must grow in maturity we can't remain infants in Christ we have to understand this and grow in understanding then he talks about the certainty of God's promise that Jesus is the surety the proof that Jesus's promise will be fulfilled in us and then he talks about Christ's superior priestly order he brings in the order of Melchizedek and again the difference here between Christ Melchizedek is a lot as an example but then Christ's presence that's different than any other priest even Aaron is that Jesus is both priest the high priest and he is also king and he brings both of those things together and in doing so is greater than any other priest that had ever lived all right questions about any of that We continue then in the eighth chapter to talk about the superior sacrificial work of the high priest. First, he presents um, that there is a new sanctuary and a new covenant, and that Jesus is superior to the old tabernacle sanctuary and to the old covenant of the law. Um, he talks about the old sanctuary and the fact that in the old sanctuary the sacrifices had to be offered <coughs> perpetually in fact there was a period of time in jewish history when it appears as though the jewish uh, priests were, were sacrificing animals 24 hours a day and it, that was necessary in order to feel like they had done enough to try to get forgiveness for the sins of the people and so all of these tens of thousands hundreds of thousands perhaps millions of animals that uh, were sacrificed their blood sprinkled on the altar that was the old way of doing things and even the high priest had to enter the Holy of Holies once a year to sprinkle the blood blood on the the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant on the Holy Seat in order to ask for forgiveness on the Day of Atonement for the Jewish uh, sins. Jesus sacrificed Himself for us once for all. The sacrifice blood of the perfect sacrifice, Jesus. Is sufficient and so therefore he is a better sacrifice it does not need to be repeated all we have to do is accept it in faith then we get into the call to follow Jesus faithfully um, talks about in the 10th chapter how we have confidence to enter the sanctuary which means enter the, the, the presence of Christ as the great sacrifice to come into his presence and to receive from him the forgiveness of our sins the salvation that he offers um, and that is that is what our faithfulness to Christ means there's also a warning against persistence in sin this is the fourth warning I don't have exhortation on this one so I could say exhortation against persistence in sin but this is the fourth warning if you live in sin you perpetually live in sin you don't seek to break that pattern of sin in your life then you are not a child of God that doesn't mean you can never sin it means if you are living a pattern of perpetual sin and you are not repentant of it, you are not willing to give it up, then you have a problem. And the exhortation is that you must give that life up. He then gets into uh, perseverance in faith under pressure. Here's where he starts to take all of, he's talking about all the faithfulness of Jesus, what he's done for us, how superior he is to everything else. And at the end, in the 10th chapter, he wraps that up in terms of saying, because of all that, because of the superiority of Jesus, the fact he is your, your savior, your mentor, the sacrifice once for all, he has done all of this for you, then you need to be willing to persevere against the persecution that you're suffering and not give in to the pressure, but stay faithful to Christ. He talks about as in the past, so in the future, meaning as you came to faith in Christ and you were aware when you came to faith in Christ of his truth as your savior and as your Lord, you need to remember that as you were then you need to be now and in the future stay in the faith that you had when you first came to the Lord 
He then goes into chapter 11 in which he gives us the, um, what's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. He talks about all of the people of faith of the Old Testament and how God credited their faith to them. But that Jesus is superior even to all of those. He talks about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and others, he says, who were people of faith. All of them had faith in God and in effect in the one who was to come. And Jesus is the supreme example of one who as the Son of God had faith in his Father and sacrificed himself for us. And we need to recognize that great sacrifice. He is the ultimate example, supreme example of trusting in God the Father. And we now can trust in Christ as his sacrifice for us. Okay. There then is more specific encouragement to persevere in hardship. The writer talks about God's fatherly love for us and the fact that as our father, that God will discipline his children. That we will know temptation and suffering that, that doesn't try to sell a bill of goods or soften the blow about the fact there will be temptation, there will be suffering. But that we need to recognize that any father who truly loves their child will discipline their child in order to make them better. Not to tear them down, not to break them. Again, that difference in temptation and testing. But rather to make us stronger. And that discipline is part of God's love for us. And so, we need to persevere in that. And we will be better for it in the end if we trust God. There is an exhortation to holy living as well, to be righteous in our lives. And then, the crowning motivation and warning that we must exercise our faith, we must encourage one another in the faith, we must be true to the grace of Christ. He then goes on to a conclusion in which he starts out by giving us rules for Christian living. Uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us, here are the things that you need to do, and some of the things you need to do in order to be living a Christian life. You need to practice hospitality. You need to show love for those brothers and sisters of the faith who are prisoners and persecuted. You need to honor marriage, pursue sexual purity. Don't fall in love with money. Don't follow false teaching. There are a number of ways in which the writer of Hebrews says, here are the, some of the ways you need to live in order to be true to your Christian calling. There then is a request for prayer. Pray for those who are in need. There is a benediction. But then after the benediction, some personal remarks. This is where they recognize Timothy has, is soon to be released from prison and they, hope, they look forward to his arrival. And then greetings and final benediction. We have every reason to believe that the Timothy who's mentioned here at the end of Hebrews is the Timothy who was also a companion of Paul. But again, that, there's, there's no reason somebody else could be referred to Timothy as well. It doesn't have to be Paul. Any questions about any of that? All of that. Some of that. Whatever. Again, this book differs from Paul's writings in that there are no rabbit trails. It is all meticulously and methodically thought through and planned out, and it is a direct line from his first declaration of the glory of Christ, the perfect manifestation of the glory of God, all the way through to the final benediction. And the first 10 chapters especially, I mean, people talk a lot about the 11th chapter, which is the Hall of Fame of Faith, which is kind of cool the way he talks about those people. But the first 10 chapters in which the, the writer argues persistently and consistently for the supremacy and superiority of Christ over everything, specifically over everything that the Jews thought was important. And it's appropriate for us today, but it was especially appropriate for those Jews who were considering, Jewish Christians, who were considering reverting to their Jewish faith because of persecution. The writer makes the argument that there is nothing about your old faith that is equal to, any way equal to, faith in Jesus Christ. So don't give it up. Now this letter has been very important down through the centuries for other people who have suffered persecution, who have been for whatever reason tempted or, or beaten uh, away from the Christian faith, 
as an encouragement that there is there is no better game than town, to put it in kind of a crude way. Um, that this here is truth. Here is God Himself. Nothing else is anything but a pale symbol by comparison. As hard as Christianity is to take sometimes, especially in times of persecution, it is the only real game of town. Everything else is just a facade. Everything else is superficial. Um, I've used the analogy before. It's like, like you walk onto a street in, in Las Vegas, and on both sides of you there are these huge facades, and there are barkers, and dancing girls, and flashing lights, and you know, oh, come on in, oh, you want to come in here? Is there a... And there's all this attraction. When in fact, if you go through those doors, you find out it's just like a movie set. There's nothing on the other side. It's just a facade, no matter how flashy it looks. Well, while you're on that street and you've got all these temptations on either side to go in a different direction, you look down the street and at the far end, as opposed to all these big flashy facades with fake marble and all that stuff, there's a little craftsman bungalow, just a little cottage at the end. It's beautiful. But it's all the way down there, and Jesus is standing on the porch, and he says, Come, you have to walk this far, and you must carry your own bags. And it'll take some effort. But if you will come here and come in, and if we do, we walk into that little craftsman bungalow, and there is a warm fire, and there is good food, and there is the fellowship of, of good and righteous people. There is a comfortable bed. There is a place where we can live find rest, find nourishment, find peace. Even though it's a tiny craftsman bungalow and we had to make an effort to get there, none of the turns into any of these big flashy looking things are, are real. The only real thing is down at the end. That's exactly the message of the book of Hebrews. Don't give in to the temptation to do something because it looks like it's gonna be better or brighter or you know even easier. Because the only real thing is down at the end, and it is Jesus, and you must follow to Him. That's what the message of Hebrews is about. That's how the just shall live. Okay? Yes? You deal with uh, a group of Jewish people who um, have a certain Christology, is that right? Or no? Well, they have this Christology. Yeah, okay, they're, they're, that, that was my question. How very, do they feel about this writing? Oh, well, these are, these are they're Christian before they're Jewish now. I mean, they are okay. Jewish Christians. They are completed Jews, so we can use that word. They are great Christians. Um, they are all genetically Jewish, and they came out of the Jewish faith, but Jesus is the Messiah, you know, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the one they worship. Everything is oriented around Him. So. Well, I'm speaking for them now. I don't know this for a fact. They they follow all of the New Testament. I mean, most of them, the ones I know, are real biblical scholars. They teach often. They write uh, on these issues. David Brickner, the head of Jews for Jesus, is you know he very seldom has time in the office because everybody wants him speaking somewhere. Um, and this would be probably the ideal of all the New Testament. They would follow all the New Testament because this this does present Jesus in the particular light and reflection of the Jewish traditions. And so they would say, we really appreciate Moses, we love the prophets, you know, these things are wonderful, but none of them equal Jesus. This is the next chapter in the story. <clears throat> it completes the story. Yeah. And that's very much what Hebrews is saying. Bob? I've always been interested in this section of Hebrews 9 where it talks about Jesus entering the most holy place by his own blood one, once for all. Right. Because, well, one reason it's, it's always interested me is I had a, a relative who was a Seventh day Adventist. And we had a lot of discussions about this because in their beginnings, they predicted that Jesus was going to return in 1844 and he didn't show up on that day. And, so then they set another date in 1944, and he didn't show up on that date. So rather than admit they were wrong, they developed this whole elaborate theology where they tried to explain what happened in 1844. Since Jesus didn't return, 
their explanation was that in 1844, he entered the most holy place and that he started what they call the investigative judgment. So that he started judging everyone, you know, and then when, he, finished, start on it, yeah. when, when he finishes that judgment, then he'll come back and that'll be the end. But it seems like they totally missed the point of this Hebrews 9. Yeah, not all Seventh-day Adventists hold to that. Some of them simply say, you know, some of the people who, early on in the history of our church, they really screwed things up. I mean, I know Seventh-day Adventists who are quite evangelical. The only thing is they still have that hang up about Saturday. I don't know what that's all about. But it's true, the Seventh-day Adventists began, and they had several instances in their history where their leaders, who were much more revered than they should have been, declared that Jesus is coming back on this day. Despite the fact that Scripture is very clear that even Jesus says he doesn't know the day of the return. Only the Father in heaven knows. What it says is, if you think you know, then that's absolutely, positively not going to be the day of the return. Mm -hmm. um, so, why are you doing this? Well, the Seventh-day Adventists had several instances that didn't happen. And you're absolutely right. At that time, they had to come up with some excuse to try to cover for the fact that this... You know, this had been just a bomb. Now, a lot of people left the, the church over that. Because a lot of people, had, it wasn't just we were waiting for Jesus to come back. A lot of people sold their farms. They lost their livelihood. And they went out and stood on the mountaintop waiting for Jesus to come back. And when he didn't, they were really messed up. And yet nowadays, I'm sure there are, you say it's your uncle? Yeah. Okay. There are people who would still hold to a theology that tries to incorporate and justify that. But a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, I believe, simply are saying, boy, those guys were wrong. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. I don't know why they did that. But here we are today, and this is what we believe. Um, and you're absolutely right. There is no way to justify Jesus entering the Holy of Holies in a spiritual way and beginning, you know, judgment and all of those kinds of things. That's not... You know, the idea is the sacrifice was made for once for all, and that's what that passage in Hebrews, so that you don't have to keep repeating it. You know, the idea that Jesus enters into the Holy of Holies one time, rather than the great the high priest having to go in once a year. And that whole thing was always so so strange and difficult for the, the there was always a fear that the high priest that his sacrifice would not be found acceptable to God and God would kill him. In fact, there was a period of time in which the Jews would tie a rope around the high priest's ankle so that when he went into the Holy of Holies, if God decided to kill him, they could at least pull his body back out of there. Okay? There, so there was very much a sense of fear that the sacrifice might not be acceptable. So much of what we're saying when we talk about Jesus being the sacrifice once for all who enters the Holy of Holies, he only has to enter it once. And the sacrifice is absolutely sufficient. There is no fear, there is no danger associated with that. Um, and so the whole point is, the old way of doing things is no longer either necessary or efficacious because the new sacrifice is available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people have wacky ideas. What, what, what is the idea of selling everything? Well, they what thought, are they gonna do with their money? Well, they thought the Lord was coming back and they were gonna be taken up into heaven so they didn't need farms and cars and houses and stuff. Why sell it? Because they can't do anything with their money. Well, they also go back to the rich and young ruler where Jesus told him to sell everything come home. So they yeah. I don't know. I can't justify it because it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like Harold Camping about the Yeah. Yeah. Short, short time after that, he went into a, to a hole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know why we keep doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And why we have to make up these intri intricate mythologies, 99% of the time, we should take the Word of God on face value. Okay. What does it say? That's probably what it means. Yes. Now, when I say 99% of the time, there are times in which we have to take, you know, take the whole of Scripture in order to understand what part of it, and that requires some interpretation. You know, when you take one verse and you try to say, okay, this just on its own, without considering what the rest of Scripture does, then you are sometimes in danger of misinterpreting something because the whole counsel of Scripture is necessary for correct interpretation. But the vast majority of the time, what it says right here is sufficient for us. Just make sure that we don't jump to conclusions that, that are not consistent with the rest of Scripture by our own misinterpretation of things. Okay. 
by Lapa. Rich Mullen was speaking at Wheaton University, and he asked them, you know, would you take just part of the scripture, or do you take scriptures here or scriptures there? And, and people, of course, we take the whole scripture, and he said, well, how many of you believe you should be born again? Of course, everybody raised their hand and said, how many of you believe you should go take everything and sell it all and get to the poor and follow Jesus? And of course, nobody raised their hand. He said, so you really do? believed to take some scripture here and some scripture there. And he said, you know, in one case, Jesus was telling one man something, and in another place, he was telling another man something. Right. So make sure you use the whole of scripture and follow it. But right. I thought that was kind of a kind of yeah, the way he did it. <laughs> although we also have to say, because Jesus said that to the rich young ruler, there's nothing that he was saying that to everyone. Right. It means exactly. he, he is saying, he may be very well be saying it to some people, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean he was saying it to everyone. He was speaking to right. that situation. I mean, there are, other, there are cases where Jesus, I believe, gave us clear instructions that we were supposed to do something and almost nobody does it anymore. I won't even get into the divorce issue. Uh, but Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and he said, as I have done this for you, you should do it for each other. We don't do that. We take other things like communion. Jesus commands about communion and baptism are not nearly as clear that he wants us to do that as washing the feet. And yet we don't do it. Well, go back and read the passages. The washing of feet, though, was really a symbolic gesture. Well, <laughs> that's easy to say. But how do we know that? How, how is it that we say that one's a symbol because that's a little unpleasant? Whereas baptism and communion we take as an absolute requirement. But as the lowest servant in the household, he washed. So any of us should be willing to be the lowest servant of the household and minister to others. Okay, but again, he didn't say you should be willing to do this. No, no. And if your heart's in the right place, you're fine. He said do this. Okay. We don't. I mean, there are some churches that they do, do, but exactly. very few. Exactly. And some of the ones I know that have done that, what they'll do is they'll take a tissue and wipe the dust off somebody's shoes. Mm -hmm. That's not what Jesus did. He took a towel and a basin, got down and washed their feet and dried it and he did that for every one of them. And they were embarrassed. Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And Jesus said, then wash my head and the rest of me also. And Jesus said, you know, if you're clean, you don't need a bath. That's not the point, Peter. And the point today is we don't walk for miles across the desert and barefoot with sandals. We but he didn't do that. No, Marvin, <laughs> he did not do that. Yeah, I mean, if he wear sandals. He didn't do that because they had dust on their feet. He did it as a sign of service. Right. And he told us to do it too, and we're not doing it. Well, Go back it. and read it, because he said, I've done this for you, do it for each other. There's many things we can do for each other. Yeah. yeah. But you see my point. I do. My point is, we pick and choose. But we don't have to be too literal. That's all I'm just trying to say. Sometimes we do all that. Well, that's what it is. But the problem is, is where do you decide where to be literal and where not? Yeah. That's where you run into Exactly. And the danger is the danger is that if we're too quick to say, oh, he didn't mean that literally, <laughs> then we start down start down a road toward liberal theology that none of it means anything anymore. It's all just symbolic. Well, it can't all just be symbolic. There's got to be something hard there. Well, I was reading David Bonhoeffer, and one really good quote said, you know, he, he healed somebody on the Sabbath, he was sick for 18 years, he could have waited another day. He, he fed and told his disciples, go ahead and eat on the Sabbath. They weren't going to starve, you know. He's, they get so literal and so fussy about the little details that they miss the whole point. And he's right in their face saying, you know, right. this, is, this is, you guys have missed the point. And I agree with that. I think, though, Often our choices are made based upon comfort and convenience. Sure. And that's the thing we have to be careful about. Mm -hmm. I have felt a conviction for years, now I'm a pastor and I could do something about it, that we should be washing each other's feet. If I tried to institute that, I'm sure there would be a hue and cry, you could hear all the way to the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually take off shoes and sandals and wash with water? I don't think good. Um, Get some, you know, another, another verse that's very interesting is when Jesus says, talks about, or not Jesus, but in one of the books he talks about have nothing to do with these people. And, of course, there's the sexually immoral and there's the others. But it also says, don't have anything to do with the person that's greedy. And he, said, and he, says, and he says, not with the world, but 
Christians that are this way in our church. And yes. you know, you can always you you see examples where oh, they're sexually immoral, and churches want to withdraw fellowship. But when have you ever seen it done because this person is greedy or a gossip or a gossip? Yeah, or and there's uh, some other things. And yeah. again, everybody's real quick to want to disassociate with somebody who is not part of your church who acts like that. Scripture is very clear. Paul is very clear when he says, you know. You should not associate with these people. And he said, I'm not talking about people outside the church, because if you did that, you'd never talk to anybody who's not in the church. I'm talking about Christians now. And he's very clear about that. And yet everybody's always condemning and shaking their finger at people outside. But we'll let people within our fellowship get away with anything. Well, hopefully we don't. I mean, we, we've, I've, I've had the unfortunate job of confronting people over a number of things. Um, how many times have I mentioned the fact that if you buy those pirated DVDs, you're stealing? Okay, I've had a number of people say they had to get rid of a whole lot of stuff after that one. You know, that, that the DVDs are being sold and the computer software that's being sold at the Wednesday market, that's stealing. And when you buy it, you are participating in theft. Don't do that. And I have said, when we talked about leadership in the church, if anyone promoted a business is that I can help you cheat on your taxes or I can have, you know, something else that clearly is not, or, or, or even if they didn't, prom, you know, have an ad, even if they just promoted that and I know about it or somebody on the leadership in our church knows about it, that person, we're all sinners, but that person would not be eligible for any role of leadership in the church. Okay? Because that's not okay. Somebody who's living with somebody else's wife. That's not okay. Um, and, and so we have to be, you know, there are some places that we have to draw lines. And I sometimes think that we, there, there's, a, there's a gray area where it's not necessary for salvation or whatever, but it's important for testimony and for our own spiritual health, and yet we don't do it because it's kind of icky. All right? Well, I, I grew up in a church that they used to, if you got divorced, you were just pretty much out of gas. And this man had been married and divorced, and they had he had come back to this church and was really wanting to be involved again. And you know their doctrine was almost impossible. They said you had to divorce everybody and go back to the first wife, which was just about as wrong. And yeah, more divorces that'll help. Right. <laughs> and so finally, this guy said, "Now I can be. You, you're saying I can't be forgiven for divorce?" And they said, "Yes." And he said, "Well, I can be forgiven for murder." And they said, "Well, yeah." And he said, "Well, all right. I'm going to go kill my first wife. So then she'll be dead, and then I'll be free to marry her. And then I'm free to be all right with this one." So they shut up and let him alone. Well, <laughs> this, this issue came up in Bible study recently. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, very, somebody said they had been part of a church that um, if someone was divorced, they were not allowed in leadership. And I said, you know what? Yes, we don't. We do not pay enough attention about what Jesus said about divorce. It, to us, it's become a casual thing. It's like just, well, I've, I've gotten out of a contract. We need to take that more seriously. Now, I think there are times in which divorce is the lesser of evils. When Jesus said, if you are unfaithful then unfaithfulness is the only only excuse for uh, infidelity, in effect, is the only excuse that makes it acceptable to divorce. Well, I think physical abuse or even emotional abuse is a kind of infidelity. I think there are times in which that's necessary. Not that it's ever good, but it is necessary. Okay? And so I don't think divorce is the end, end all and be all of sin, and yet I think that we take it so casually when in fact it breaks the heart of God. I think people are going to, in some way, be held accountable for that if they did not, if, it, if they did not really have a good reason for it, right. because they just decided they didn't like that person as much as they thought they did. Which is, I think, quite often that's the motivation. You know, that this um, unreconcilable differences is the term we use these days. But having said that, if there is a church that says if you're divorced, you cannot ever again be involved in leadership. I say just what you said, and, and that is, that means you cannot be forgiven of a sin. That means anybody, anybody who has committed a sin cannot be involved in leadership. We can't have any leaders. Everyone can be forgiven. Now, we need to take the sin seriously. But anyone can be forgiven. Anybody can be reinstated. I do think that there may be limits. You know, ministers, especially visible ministers, who have committed 
moral transgressions more than once need to just be in the congregation for a while. They don't need to be reinstated in positions of leadership. Okay? And so there are some places where I say, no, for your health and the health of the body, you're stepping down. But not because there's any sin that cannot be forgiven, that cannot be healed. But simply because there's some people that they need, they need the time, they need a different setting in which to really recover from those sins. To really deal with it and confess it. And we've had cases where, you know, mega church ministers, there's one, well, I won't mention the name. He's been called with prostitutes twice and he's still leading a church of like 8,000 people. Okay, there's something wrong with that. So, okay, enough of that. It's almost 2.30. Um, the book of Hebrews, it's a good one. Make sure you read it.